Let's take it to the limit one more time. Miami Vice is up next on Rediscovered Movies. Hello, welcome to episode of Rediscovered Movies. I'm your host, Nam Fanella Malloy. So the film that I'll be discussing today is Miami Vice. Miami Vice is a 2006 action crime film that is a reimagining of the 1980s TV series, which was executive produced by Michael Mann. So this film was written, directed, and co-produced by Michael Mann, who's known for directing films such as Collateral and Heat. The film stars Colin Farrell, Jamie Foxx, and Gong Lee. So here is the synopsis. A case involving drug lords and murder in South Florida takes a personal turn for undercover detective Sonny Crockett and Ricardo Tubbs. Unorthodox Crockett, sorry, unorthodox Crockett gets involved romantically with Chinese Cuban wife of a trafficker of arms and drugs while Tubbs deals with an assault on those he loves. So the film was released in theaters on July 28, 2006. Uh, For the box office, it made over $164.9 million worldwide with the budget of $135 million. It opened at number one domestically with over 36 million. It beaded films including Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, which features co-star Naomi Harris, John Tucker Must Die, and Monster House. In terms of critical reception, it has a 47% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, where they say Miami Vice is beautifully shot, but the lead characters lack the charisma of their TV series counterparts, and the underdeveloped story is well below the standards of Michael Mann's better films. The audience gave it 43%. At the time of this recording, it is streaming on Stars and Tubi. It is also available on demand, so check your local provider. Let's get into First Discovery. So, at the time when this movie was coming out, I saw promos for this movie, which uh, got me excited to see the movie in theaters. Because at this point, I saw uh, Collateral, which I find it's a great film. Check it out if you haven't seen it. So I saw this movie opening weekend in theaters. And I don't remember my initial thoughts at the time because it's been so long ago. Like I was in high school when this movie came out. But I just recall that it was very intense and quite dark um, with its uh, filmmaking choices. And after rewatching the movie recently for this podcast, I really enjoyed this movie as an action crime thriller. Because I felt on the edge of my seat throughout this movie, like wasn't sure what to expect. Because I think also, too, the choice of the of the camera work and all that stuff really helped enhance that experience and I have not seen the original series I think I saw one episode so I don't have that attachment to the series so for me maybe that's why I enjoyed this movie more as opposed to some people who are fans of the series when they watch this movie with their thoughts. So, but from what I could tell, just based on how the original series was shot, it was clearly with this movie going for a different direction. Like they really wanted to detach it from the original series in regards to visual style, like with uh, being very dark and grim as opposed to being lighthearted with the original series. And a while back, I saw this uh, video on YouTube by Patrick Willems called Tenet and a Celebration of Vibes Movies. And I rewatched that video while I was uh, wor- working on this episode of the podcast. And so he mentioned in this video that with Miami Vice, because it was heavily mentioned in this movie, 
but it focuses, focuses more on Tenet. So essentially, he calls VIBES, acronym for Valiant Individuals Besting Engagement Stylishly. So it's usually in the action genre, characters, they have a goal or a mission to accomplish. And sometimes um, as an audience, you're not sure what's quite happening, but it doesn't matter because you are swept away with the glamour, with the locations, the spectacle the spectacle, and loneliness. And he brought up in the video where Harmony Corinne, he's a big fan of Michael Mann and Miami Vice. So I think, yeah, this quote would apply to to, uh, people's um, thoughts on this movie, hopefully. Um, He says, The movie I watched most, believe it or not, was Michael Mann's Miami Vice. The reason I love his movies, and that movie in particular, is I could feel the place. When I watch that film, I don't even pay attention to what they're saying or the storyline. I love the colors. I love the texture, which is uh, interesting. So I, I wasn't lost myself while watching this movie, but there were some points like I didn't quite get when it came to the to the police jargon. But at the end of the day, as long as I get the gist of the movie in terms of the goals from beginning to end, you should be completely fine. Or as in this video, like Patrick Williams, he uh, shows a quote, the famous quote from the movie Tenet, where the character is like, oh, um, just feel it. So probably for while watching this movie, feel it as opposed to overthink it. Let's get into the highlights. So Michael Mann's direction. So as I mentioned, he was involved in the original series as executive producer. So here he is trying to go for a different take on the series. And I say for me, it worked for the most part, because I think with the the um, directing style the, the choice of camera work and all that stuff, it has its pros and cons. I'll get to the cons in the low light section. So with the pros, essentially, I liked how it's similar to his more later works, such as Collateral, uh, Public Enemies, in terms of using shaky cam, having a documentary style of filmmaking, And then you also have on top the low light conditions, especially during the night scenes. There's some tiny bit of grainy footage. And yeah, like I, even though like it's different um, from action movies uh, during that time, at least it tries to do something different. Now, do people like it? Um, That is debatable. And Of course, he's known, Michael Mann is known for having realism with the action scenes because, for instance, um, you could tell like with the action scenes in this movie, like, for example, when the when the police are raiding the trailer park to rescue uh, Trudy, there's not a lot of um, editing I suppose, with that movie. And they probably, I I believe with this movie, they used um, a lot of um, real animation and and probably just uh, recorded sounds from from those uh, guns as opposed to doing it in post. And also, too, this movie, as uh, you would see in his previous movies, it focuses on essentially law enforcement versus the criminals. And here, like with this movie, it does a good job with that. And particularly with the, the romance between Sonny and Isabella, because they are both from different sides. And obviously that does not work out at the end. Another highlight for this movie is that the death, the deaths in this movie, ugh, tongue to this are brutal because you actually see the kills and they're quite bloody um it's not gory but um you really feel it when you see those moments so for example when the undercover agents are trying to escape from the bad guys uh during the first act 
you see like from multiple camera angles, they get shot brutally to actually show that they're dead. So and that was an interesting choice. And also to add with the slow motion to really show the effects of the bullets in that scene. The casting in this movie is solid. So Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx for me worked as a Sonny and Ricardo because I felt they had good chemistry throughout this movie and the characters they they really have each other's backs when there's some people particularly with uh, the FBI agent Fujima might have doubts but at least I like how the characters have each other's backs and essentially both they play too cool for school and they know their stuff during their cover and interactions with their colleagues uh, and Fujima. The supporting cast is solid as well, too. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, Naomi, Harris, Naomi Harris as Trudy. Uh, I, th- I felt she did a great job with this movie, even though she's not have featured a lot in this movie. I think this was the first movie I saw of hers, because I think with Pirates, I didn't see it till a few years uh, later after initially seeing this movie. And and I liked um, the scene, like, when she gets uh, kidnapped, you really feel the in- intensity when she is blindfolded. And, yeah, that was just awesome. Also, too, Elizabeth Rodriguez as Gina Calabresi, because she's uh, very unrecognizable with the blonde hair and I love how the character she essentially tough as nails um, most notably like when there's a stare down between her and the um, the Aryan Brotherhood in the trailer park when uh, when she's pointing the machine gun towards them and she recites that whole speech brilliant and also to John Ortiz as Jose Yero because he the character is quite slimy, has a slimy middleman, and has a trust issue, particularly with Sonny, as noted uh, during their first interactions with uh, Sonny and Ricardo. And I just wonder, like, with this role, did that uh, influence his casting as Brega in Fast and Furious 4? Maybe? I don't know. But then also, too, I, I noticed that he worked with man a lot after this movie, particularly in Public Enemies and Black Hat. Interesting. And this movie features uh, this uh, quote, time is luck, which is very interesting. I have a trivia fun fact on that. I'll, I'll explain in that section. So in this movie, Isabella, she tells Sonny this twice. The first time is when they're hanging out in Havana. She tells him, yeah, time time is luck. And then the second time is during the final scene before she departs. She tells him time is luck. Because clearly when they hook up, the romance is forbidden for obvious reasons. And it's quite funny that they admit that it's a bad idea, but still continue. Regardless, until stuff happens in this movie. The opening sequence at the nightclub is fun because it's an interesting choice where after showing the Universal logo with um, with no instrumental music, it does like a smash cut to, uh, to the girl uh, dancing at the nightclub. Interesting choice. And then we see... Uh, Sonny, Ricardo, and Trudy, they're doing their surveillance during an undercover operation. And I love how there's a bunch of needle drops. So immediately the first song that starts the movie is Numb Encore by uh, Jay-Z and Linkin Park. And with that song was heavily featured in the marketing for this movie. And also too, you have a Sooner remix by Nina Simone. That's a catchy tune. And that song is quite popular during like the 2000s in some movies, particularly um, if you guys seen the movie Cellular, that was heavily featured in that movie. Um, I enjoyed the scene when Alonzo meets Sonny and Ricardo, because we see clearly Alonzo is on the run from something and then it cuts to it looks like the bad guys uh 
dismembering someone, but it shows like the aftermath of that. And it's quite heartbreaking when Alonzo finds out that Leonetta, his wife, got killed, even though I guess the people he was involved with assured him that that was not going to happen if he uh, complied. So that was uh, tough. And then the fact he decided to just commit suicide by jumping in front of the, the truck. Brutal. And I enjoyed uh, the moment during um, the first meeting of Jose, Sonny, and Ricardo that um, Sonny, he pulls out the grenade <laughs> during a meeting when when it uh, gets uh, tough there. That was quite enjoyable, but luckily uh, it didn't get too escalated when Isabella intervenes. Even though like this movie is serious... It has a few comedic moments. So, for one, with Sonny tells Jose during the meeting that, uh, oh, my mommy and daddy know me, which is hilarious. Um, this was after when Jose, like, uh, pretty much tells Ricardo, like, oh, I don't trust Sonny. Oh, and I don't know you. So, that was quite hilarious. And another moment, I don't know if it was in, supposed to be intentionally funny. But essentially, after the failure of the exchange later in the movie, Jose shows uh, Montoya like the footage of Isabella and Sonny dancing at the club because clearly he is using that as a scapegoat because he was supposed to be responsible for the exchange. But clearly, Jose has his own motives, which I will get into later. But I thought that was quite funny. And... I'm just glad that with Sonny and Ricardo, they were not exposed as cops because clearly here they know what they're doing because they've done this sort of stuff before. Maybe not up to this level when it involves um, uh, drug, drug lords from outside the country. But yeah, good on them for keeping their cool, I suppose, when it gets tough. And... Lastly, I want to talk about the music and the score. So the score is done by John Murphy. And the score is quite, um, it's dark, I guess, to emulate the overall tone for this movie. And I liked how, like, um, it got very tense with the score, particularly when, like, Trudy gets uh, kidnapped. Like, I mean, when the team learns that Trudy gets kidnapped, so interesting choice with the score and of course as mentioned there's a bunch of needle drops in this movie so another one to note is that um the song in the air tonight by phil collins that was a notable track from the original series here they do i guess a different version by non-point it's a very uh, like a rock and roll eccentric uh, version of that song and the band Auto Slave, uh, which featured uh, the late Chris Cornell, have uh, two songs in this movie, which include Wide Awake and Shape of Things to Come. Interesting. And lastly, Moby, he had two songs, but one of the songs that I enjoyed was One of These Mornings with uh, Patti LaBelle. This was when they are heading, when Sonny and Isabella are heading to Havana by boat. So. Good on those choices. Now let's get on to the low light section. Now, as I mentioned, that with the filmmaking style of this movie has its pros and cons. So, the cons I'll talk about is a, is a, a notable choice during the scene when Sunny and Ricardo meet Alonzo. So, after when Ricardo tells Alonzo what what happened with Leonetta. The camera pans to the left and then shows like a POV shot of paper billowing from the barrier. So I'm like, why Why is this uh, going that way? But I guess to show Alonzo's perspective, even though he's looking at Sonny and Ricardo. I don't know. And then, and then it cuts to Alonzo like lunging towards the moving truck. And then it shows, and then the camera's um, is still pointed towards like the truck moving, and then we see like the 
the blood on the road, and then a abrupt cut to Sonny and Ricardo in the car heading to Alonso's house. So, yeah, I don't know um, if I would go with that choice as a filmmaker myself, but it's interesting. I'll leave it at that. So after when the team rescues Trudy from the trailer park, there's a setup um, where Jose sets up the, the bomb by calling the cell phone. And then the explosion happens. And I would say, thank God Trudy, he, she left. She went outside because Ricardo told her to stay inside when they tried to clear the area. But then <laughs> when the explosion happened, it looked wonky because I don't know if it's because they used CGI, or if it was because the choice of the camera work and the uh, filmmaking style that made it look that way, but it looked off if it was done practical. And I saw, like, I typically uh, I try to avoid looking at reviews while um, doing podcast episodes. But I saw, like, for some, they note that um, Sonny and Ricardo's relationship was not um, a huge uh, aspect of this movie. And I'd probably have to agree with that because, again, I have not seen the original series, but I imagine they focus on the, that relationship a lot since it's body cop show. And... Here, it's not the typical buddy cop movie. And I felt, yeah, they could have focused on that more because here they're shown more as co-workers <laughs> as opposed to friends, even though we could kind of tell, yeah, that they get along and all that stuff. Because here with the movie, they focus more on the romantic relationships with their respective partners. Well, Ricardo with Trudy even though not that much, and Sunny with Isabel, which was the main focus. So I think here's how I'll put it. If if this movie had no attachments to Miami Vice, it was just like, if it was like a completely different movie, I'd probably not cared about this a lot. Um, but um, since it has the attachment to the show, I could see people's issues with that point of the movie and there are some questions i have for this movie who was the source of the leak because ricardo tells fujima to send different messages um because fujima he leaves a task force that fo- that has different agencies excluding the miami pd and then it's revealed that the FBI is a source for one of the messages that uh, Ricardo sends. And then afterwards, Fujima disappears from the rest of the movie because I watched the theatrical cut. So I'm just wondering with the director's cut, does it answer some of these questions? I don't know. So I just felt like when that was revealed, it just disappeared along with Fujima from the rest of the movie. So I guess it doesn't matter, but I would I would have loved to know. And I wondered with Jose, like, what was his endgame? Because clearly, from minute one, he did not trust uh, Sonny and Ricardo, particularly with Sonny. And I'm just wondering, why does he um, try to take over the exchange of the goods last minute? And then he gets the Aryan Brotherhood to kidnap Trudy. So I'm just wondering, what's the point in all of this? Is it to prove to Montoya that, yeah, like these guys can't be trusted. So I eliminated them. I don't know. Because it feels more than trust issues. And he does not suspect them as cops. I'm just wondering, what was his goal? I don't know. And I wondered with Jose, sticking to him, does he have a thing for Isabella? Because when he sees Isabella and Sunny together at his nightclub, 
getting too close. We see he gets teary eyed with the close up shot. So that do, so does he have a thing to her, or was he disappointed that you know Elizabella is essentially choosing Sunny over Montoya? I don't know. And I felt that going with Isabel and Sunny, they could have done a better job hiding that relationship because it's been pointed out throughout the movie that there are eyes everywhere, but they disregard that when they are together. So, and shame on Sunny because as an undercover cop, you should have known better. And during the final shootout, Sonny, he pulls out his badge. Why? <laughs> because um, we see Isabella, she notices that, and then she immediately confronts the guy, which could have almost got both of them killed, but luckily Sonny got the upper hand on that, so Sonny could have just waited till after the shootout to reveal, oh, I'm a cop, but... I thought it was hilarious. And I also wondered, the last point, what happened to Montoya like after the shootout? Because the last time we see him is when he is upset with Jose, and that's when Jose shows him the footage of Isabella and Sunny. So it's implied, because we see the final shot of the police raiding his place, which is empty. So is he on the run? Did something happen? I don't know. Does the director's cut explain all this? I don't know. I have not seen a director's cut at the time of this recording, but if you have, please let me know if it answers these questions I have. Let's get on to trivia. So, fun facts. There's a lot for this movie, so I tried to narrow it down. Jamie Foxx. He brought up the idea for this movie to Michael Mann during a party for Ali. This led to Mann to revisit the series he helped create. And here we are. And there are some casting notes. So for before Colin Farrell was cast, there were some notable names considered, which included Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, and Matthew McConaughey. And also too for... Do, 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 for Tubbs, um, actors in, considered were Will Smith, Denzel Washington, and Samuel L. Jackson. So I think the casting notes for both of those characters are interesting. So also, too, when the film version was being developed by Michael Mann, so Don Johnson, who played Sonny in the original series, he was asked who he liked to see portray his character, and he suggested Colin Farrell. So maybe that suggestion led Michael Mann to cast Colin Farrell? Who knows? So Michael Mann, he had his actors trained with real-life undercover law enf- enforcement officers. Both Jamie and Colin observed uh, the operations from a safe distance, Farrell was told he learned so much he was welcome to participate in the real sting operation. During the operation, um, which was apparently caught in video excerpts which are shown in the DVD extra, guns were drawn and the officer's identity is questioned. Farrell reports being scared of his life. He spontaneously ripped open his shirt to demonstrate he wasn't wearing a wire. An active agent in charge later commended for being realistic, quick-witted, improv improvisation after suffering anxiety and insomnia that night Farrell contacted the agent in charge and was told that the sting operation was staged and he was never in any danger he was to be told the next morning during a debrief wow because yeah that that would have been tough it was actually real but wow now this movie has been noted for having a lot of issues during the production. So here is what I could gather. So several crew members, they criticized Michael Mann uh, with his decisions during production, including the script changes, filming in unsafe weather conditions and locations that, quote, 
Even the police avoid drafting gang members to work as security. Wow. Well, well. And between when he was cast and started production, Jamie Foxx, you know, he won the Oscar for Ray. Uh, says greatly increasing his ego and demands. He was being paid less than Colin Farrell and demanded a raise. Farrell's salary was cut. Fox refused to fly commercially, forcing Universal to provide a private jet. He wouldn't participate in scenes on boats or planes. After gunshots were fired on set in the Dominican Republic on October 24, 2005, Fox packed up, left the country, and refused to work outside of the U.S., this forced Michael Mann to change the original ending, which was to be filmed in Uruguay. Interesting. And I tried to research what was the original ending, and essentially nobody knows, so only Michael Mann knows, so... I don't know. Now, Isabella, as I mentioned, she tells Sunny twice this line, time is luck. So apparently that was used previously in Heat when Neil was trying to convince Edie to leave with him and also too was mentioned in Manhunter when Molly says it to Will Graham. And later in an interview with Total Film, Colin Farrell, he admitted, quote, I didn't like it so much. I thought it was style over substance and I accepted a good bit of the responsibility. It was never going to be lethal weapon, but I think we missed an opportunity to have a friendship that also had some uh, ugh, some elements of fun. And lastly, during a 2016 interview with New York Magazine, Michael Mann described his disappointment with the film, saying, quote, I don't know how I feel about it. I know the ambition behind it, but it didn't fulfill that ambition for me because we couldn't shoot the real ending. So I will just say this with the ending. I think the ending is is fine, uh, just given the circumstances. Again, if we had known what the original ending is, my opinion might change. But for now, I'm fine with the ending the way it is. Now, lastly, I usually ask this question, should this movie be rediscovered? And I say absolutely yes, because I enjoyed it, because it tries to go for a different look, clearly from the original source material, but also as an action movie, it tries to be different, which, in my opinion, was ahead of its time. And I say if you like Michael Mann's movies, you'll like this movie. That pretty much concludes this episode of the podcast. So you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Linktree at Numfi Malloy. You can find the podcast on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Linktree at RD Movies Pod. On Spotify, you can answer the question, the poll, and rate the podcast. On Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review and rate the podcast. You can submit questions, comments, suggestions by email, which is rediscoveredmovies at gmail.com, or you can send a voice message on Spotify for podcasters slash RD Movies Pod to be featured on the after show, which will air after the season finale. So all the links to this stuff will be available in the description. And I want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of the podcast, and I'll catch you on the next one. Oh,